in history, there's often a time and a place when you can say, everything changed. In the American War for Independence, also known as the Revolutionary War, that would be 3 p.m. on a cold, damp Saturday afternoon on October 7, 1780. The place? Kings Mountain, near the town of Blacksburg in the back country of South Carolina, just over the North Carolina border. The prospects for the beleaguered American military didn't seem particularly good in 1780. In March, the British opened their southern campaign, taking the mightily important port city of Charleston after a two-month siege. This opened the way for them to march inland. Their strategy was to rally what they believed to be a large number of loyalists living in the Carolinas, and then to enlist them into militias that would aid British troops in controlling the territory before heading north to Virginia. Strategy and reality are often two different things. The British were hoping to frighten Patriot sympathizers with threats and terror tactics, but they encountered a new form of warfare in the South, and a new kind of warrior. Early victories gave the British a sense that their strategy was working. On May 29, 1780, British Colonel Bannister Tarleton attacked a force of 400 Patriots from Virginia near Waxhaws, South Carolina, killing 113 and wounding 100 after refusing to accept their surrender. Bloody Ban, as he was called, wanted to make an example, but his action enraged the South and set the stage for what was going to happen at King's Mountain. British Major Patrick Ferguson, a 36-year-old Scotsman, led a force of 1,100 loyalists into the back country. He sent word ahead that he was coming, warning anyone who refused to lay down their arms that he would lay waste to their country with fire and sword. The threat was received by a group of backwoodsmen who lived over the Appalachian Mountains, the so-called over-mountain men. They rendezvoused at Sycamore Shoals near Elizabethton, Tennessee in late September. Their leaders, Colonels William Campbell, Isaac Shelby, Charles McDowell, and John Sevier led a force of about 900 to meet Ferguson, who had arrived at Kings Mountain on October 6th. Rather than link up with a much larger army group under General Charles Cornwallis just 30 miles away in Charlotte, Ferguson boldly, and as it turned out, fatally decided to make a stand on King's Mountain. Spies told him the Overmountain men were coming, but he apparently was surprised when they arrived the next day. Perhaps he was expecting the Americans to form ranks so that both sides could fire volleys at each other from close range in the conventional manner of the day. But the woodsmen were about to introduce him to unconventional warfare. The terrain offered the Americans ample cover and concealment. They also carried long-barreled rifled muskets, accurate at a range of up to 300 yards. The British were armed with the so-called Brown Bess musket. It could be reloaded much faster, but only had an effective range of about 75 yards. Ferguson was surrounded, and he was outgunned. The battle lasted about an hour. Ferguson rallied his troops, ordering three bayonet charges to drive the Americans back. He made an unmistakable target. He was mounted, he was wearing a distinctive blue and white check shirt, and he was shouting commands and blowing a whistle. When he was hit the first time, he was partially knocked from his horse. His foot was stuck in the stirrup, and he was dragged in front of his men. Reports say an American asked if he would surrender. And in a last defiant act, Ferguson shot him with a pistol. Seconds later, he was hit with at least six musket balls. His men began waving white flags, but the Americans shouted, remember Waxhaws, and the killing continued until officers regained control. The British suffered 290 killed, 163 wounded, and 668 taken prisoner. A woman, Virginia Sal, believed to be Ferguson's mistress, was also killed and is thought to have been buried with him near where he fell. The Americans lost 28 killed and 62 wounded. The dead were hastily buried in unmarked graves. The Americans were worried about a counterattack from Cornwallis, so they quickly disappeared back into the woods. 
Word of the victory at King's Mountain spread like wildfire. Three months later, the British suffered another stunning defeat nearby at the Battle of Cowpens. The victories not only caused Patriot morale to soar, they convinced the French to fully commit their forces, which ultimately led to the collapse of the British efforts in the South. On October 19, 1781, almost a year from the day of the Battle of King's Mountain, Lord Cornwallis was forced to surrender his entire army to General George Washington at Yorktown, Virginia. He'd hoped to evacuate his troops by sea, but the French fleet arrived and he was trapped. The war didn't end until September 1783, but the tide had definitely turned in favor of the Americans in the Carolinas. Visiting a place like Kings Mountain proves once again that travel is one of the few things we can buy that will make us richer. <laughs>